Welcome to this video about network concepts. It was not the plan that this uh, lecture should be produced as a video. However, because I am uh, rather have a, a rather streaming cold at the moment, uh, it seems the best way to go. It will be fairly long as a video, so please bear with this. In this video, I want to cover five overall topics. The first is to give some thought to our interconnected world and arising out of that to think about some issues, uh, social issues, security issues and other things relating to that. Then I want to move on and think in more detail about the layered models that we referred to in our previous lecture. And then I want to think a little bit about standards and protocols and finally to round up with network topology and some issues that arise out of that. So let's begin by thinking about the development of computer systems and networks actually. For the average person, I mentioned before that around about 1970 we would have been thinking about standalone mainframes or mini computers with all the links back to the central computer via an RS-232 uh, communications link. By the late 70s the micro had appeared and these were used standalone. There was no concept of networking at that point. But by the mid 80s early networks were already being used for centralised storage and shared printing particularly. By the, uh, around about 1990 we had the internet and email were becoming increasingly common and um, by the late 90s we had the rise of the web and all the stuff that you'd now recognize and know about for modern times in terms of e-commerce, media, social stuff, web 2 and so on. And the thought that we now expect 24-7 web access, don't forget that's a fairly recent phenomenon and also we expect decent bandwidth. What about the internet? Well that started a lot earlier. I have in my head that ARPANET started in the late 40s following the Second World War. The US military defence were using computing to uh, manage their their defence systems and we were living in the shadow of the bomb. Um, we still are in many ways, we still um, have uh, issues about Trident and all the rest of it but actually it was a big deal. We'd just seen Hiroshima and we were concerned about what happens if someone does the big one and drops an atomic bomb on a nation. So the US were thinking about the fact that if their entire defence depended on a single centralised computer and the bomb happened to hit that computer, they were defenceless. So ARPANET uh, involved a small but a network of computers with the idea being that if a bomb landed in one area of the states and took out the whole load of computing there would be other computers around and the idea was that because they were linked they could maintain functionality you would clearly lose functionality as you lose parts of the network but it was the as i've said on the slide here uh, terminator uh, style graceful degradation the idea being that goes back to uh, the uh, early terminator movie where i remember seeing a, a, a shot where arnie schwarzenegger has some sort of shell fired through his head blasts a hole in his head and he reels a bit and then uh, the morphing goes on and the hole is covered up. Uh, the, the point being that if you, if you blow a hole in a network then the network should be able to work out a way of moving around the, the problems and still maintaining functionality for the rest of the network. The US military moved on and they bequeathed ARPANET to academics and so in these early days we had a philosophy of free sharing of information as academics do. We don't expect to charge for information, we expect to share and collaborate. And that became the internet. So then if we move uh, on uh, to the 1990s we can see the rise of the World Wide Web and business catches on. We've now got something that the, the general public can use, and very nice and friendly with our graphical interfaces in effect through the World Wide Web. And we have the idea of the global village or the global market. We have a business philosophy coming in at that point where everything costs, including information. 
leading to this incredible, bizarre duality, which was really strange in the 90s, um, about the idea that the same information can be available free, or you can pay for it. That's particularly obvious when you look at weather. Uh, And you can either pay the Met Office for their highest quality weather information, or you can get weather information that's probably just as good quality freely from other sources. Then there's also another bizarre duality which is typified by the Microsoft and open source setup. So you'll be particularly aware of that in terms of Android phones, for example, where you can pay for apps or you can have apps free. And you will be well aware of the fact that paying for apps doesn't necessarily mean they're better quality than the ones that are available free. This is bizarre. People are still managing, 20 years on, to make plenty of money by charging for stuff that you can get free elsewhere. Wow. So why are we interested in networks? Well, there's things like resource sharing, so the fact we can remotely access printers, uh, data, we can communicate, we've got all the social media stuff, we've got Facebook forums, we've got information like Wikipedia, Wiki, how, or whatever it is. There's e-commerce, which most of us, I guess, will be well and truly into. Um, We've got things like online software delivery, Uh, we've got the cloud, we've got e-tainment, if we can call it that, YouTube, audio, online gaming, this lecture, and so on. Um, But the crucial thing is things have changed dramatically in recent years. So the point of this particular slide is for us to pause for a moment and for you to have a little think about what is it that you would consider as crucially important in terms of having internet access 24-7. Let you think about that for a moment, but let me just point out that sometimes we watch TV programmes, and if you look back to the 70s, say, we didn't have mobile phones. We didn't expect to be connected 24-7. If you were making an arrangement to see someone, you made that arrangement, and you stuck to that, and there was no concept of being able to say, oh, actually, I've got delayed in traffic, I'll see you half an hour's time, or, oh, no, actually, this won't work, let's meet somewhere else. You couldn't do that. You had to make an arrangement, you had to stick to it, and you had to allow for the fact that someone might be delayed and you've just got to kick around not knowing what's going on. There are massive social implications of the changes that we've seen in the last 30 odd years. So there is a change to buying patterns and that's very clear that businesses that are not keeping up with the changes are struggling. Big businesses worth mega bucks are struggling if they are unable to cope with the idea of how things change. There's that lovely uh, business um, in Bournemouth that was on the local news, uh, the Solent News, uh, right, sorry, was it South Today on BBC? Uh, they were on recently about a, a business that is effectively marketing through YouTube and it's all about image and style and everything else they will succeed because they're keeping up with how things are changing. But there is a whole change in buying patterns. There's a change in social networks. I can remember the days when I was first astonished to discover, um, well, not astonished to discover that my son was upset. My son was upset. Uh, I think he was might still have been a teenager or might have been early 20s. Uh, a friend of his had uh, slipped on ice in Richmond and gone into the Thames and drowned and he was really distraught about this. The thing that surprised me was when it dawned on me that he'd never met this guy. He only knew him from an online acquaintance. Um, pleased that he was Oh, not pleased, you know what I mean. Uh, you know, it, it was good that he was upset about that, but it's quite strange for someone like, like me to get my head around the fact that you can have this closeness of relationship with someone that you've never actually met. 
Uh, other social implications is accountability is a big issue. So to me, there is a real problem. Things like cyberbullying and uh, when people go online and wind people up and encourage them to commit suicide and so on and all these horrible things that go on online. There, to me, there is a, a fundamental problem here in that there is a lack of accountability. You can do all this stuff, and yes, you know that if someone's keen, they can track you down, but there's, it's not the same as seeing someone face-to-face -face and eyeballing them. Things like music distribution, and now I've got Arctic Mon Monkeys on the slides, we've got much more modern issues, but a, a music artist today, if they want to progress probably needs to be making an impact on the social media and YouTube and things if they're going to be successful. It's not like the original ways that we had years ago um, when you got signed up by a big company and they pushed through the, the BBC and ITV and got airtime and so on. It doesn't work like that anymore. Then there's also legal implications. Things are different in an interconnected world. So the internet is international. That means that because the laws change from country to country, it is more difficult to prosecute. We're learning as the years roll by how to deal with that and how to uh, have an effect. Uh, but it's not the same as it used to be when you controlled your boundaries and you controlled when, what went on with your, within your boundaries. It's before your time, but I remember the Cold War and I remember when the wall in Berlin came down and some of the... there's a strong argument for why the... Um, the Iron Curtain, as it was called, came down, was because the internet, with its freely available information, made it impossible for there to be the closed environment where, which, which thrived on misinformation and uh, lack of knowledge of the outside world. You couldn't do it anymore. There's things like uh, data protection, so how can I stop people sharing my information? Again, on the BBC One show, I think it was in the last day or two, we've had a discussion about people nicking photographs that are for which, if they're your photographs, you have the copyright. And if people nick them, then they should be paying you for them or not doing it, or whatever, or they should have your permission. Uh, regardless of where the, the photograph has come from, and there was a discussion of how one might deal with that. There's issues like privacy versus policing. So is it my right to privacy, or is it the government's right to enforce law and to protect against terrorism? So again, highly topical at the moment with Snowden, Edward Snowden's revelations, apparently, he says, uh, that's GCHQ have total access to our smartphones in the UK, even to the extent of being able to turn them on or off if they wish. I believe that is certainly technically possible and uh, I, at, at the very least we know that the government are very keen to be able to use all the information they can get in quote the fight against terrorism. There is an issue that we'll come to on the next slide with that, but hey, we'll, um, we'll deal with that in a moment. There's also things like freedom of speech versus libel. Big, big issues and the issues that need to be, dis to, to be thought through and discussed in terms of where the balance should come. So should we protect the, the rights of the whistleblower, make sure that they can, um, things like the Jimmy Savile stuff has come back into the news again this week, so there's things like should we protect folk who want to bring abuses of the law to light or should we be thinking more in terms of protecting the, the rights of those who are falsely attacked and that's also part of the discussion this week I notice. So it's a big issue about where that balance comes. Let's move on to think about things in terms of security. So we have things like spam, phishing, spyware and viruses. Uh, none of those things existed 
back in the 70s. I remember the first viruses. I don't particularly remember the first spyware, but I do remember a time when there wasn't spyware, for example. Some of the things like spam and phishing and identity theft are actually not new, it's just the context is different. Now this other thing I mentioned a moment ago, the issue of Big Brother governments. Uh, I remember growing up and reading George Orwell's 1984, when 1984 was still in the future, and us being horrified at the picture of what we all saw as being the ultimate police state, things like Nazi Germany and um, Communist Russia. Folks, just think about GCHQ, the fight against terrorism. How close are we to the British government being a 1984 scenario? Have we sleepwalked into a situation where we've allowed ourselves to become a, a, a police state where everything is monitored and controlled? Big question. There's also the issue of uh, things like the Mafia, uh, the Russian Mafia maybe, the, uh, not particularly the um, Italian Mafia, sorry anyone who's from Russia, I don't mean that particularly, it's just that I mean that we have instances of the Mafia in Russia where there are things that you can do, for example, if you have a competing business on the web and you want to gain a competitive advantage if you have the right contact cat please try again the right contacts then it's possible to pay someone to start a ddos a distributed denial of service attack bring that website down for however long you need it down for two or three days a week if uh, in extreme cases if you've got enough money to pay for that and uh, get the competitive advantage and then when they come back online they've already lost the, the the advantage they had. Card fraud is another area where they can monitor everything that's going on and when they see a stream of 16 digits, ah maybe that's a card number, maybe following that will be a PIN number. So those sorts of things are all issues in an online interconnected world. As it says on the slide here, this does need a whole lecture, a whole module. You'll have a whole module next year, so I don't want to step on toes there. Just open up the big issues. OK, so let's move on to think about layered design and take that a step further from where we've been so far. So first of all, let's start with a reminder that the idea of a layered design is that we have um, interfaces to implement services that each layer offers to the layer above it. So we abstract out a particular set of concepts and rather than mixing things up with having all this detail exposed, we just provide certain links into it from above and also links below actually so it can link through. That means if we want to make a change to any particular layer then we can do that so long as we keep the actual interfaces above and below the same. Uh, it means that we can facilitate interoperability and um, because we've got our common interfaces between the layers. Uh, we can have uh, common addressing schemes between the layers. Um, we can allow each layer to have a particular job, so the transport layer uh, takes the the information from the application layer and provides it uh, in chunks for the network layer. The network layer can then work out how to get those chunks of data across the interme inter inter intermediate networks. In terms of our layered models, we'll be thinking about how the network layer itself can be divided up. Let's move on to the uh, layered models and we're going to be thinking about a five layered model. So within this model we've, the five layers are the application layer, that's basically the software that uh, runs and needs network access. It will provide facilities and on the slide here you'll see it's saying that it deals with www, well it should say HTTP, that's the protocol it deals with. File transfer protocol or the simple mail transfer protocol, those are examples of the sorts of protocols we'll be thinking about in that layer. The transport layer is dealing with hosts, so it's host to host um, sender to receiver uh, communication. 
and it should hide the network structure from the application. We don't care what the network structure is, we don't care whether it's wireless or wires or what's going on, just so long as we deal with the idea of getting the message to the far end. We then drop into the network layer, so the transport layer sends the message down to the network layer. That deals with packets and it needs to find a route across the network. It was all about the, how to trans, transverse the network. So there's routing and flow control in there because flow control is in there because we have a route but we also need to know that if we just jam the network up with loads of packets that it can't handle with at that rate it's going to be a problem. So it needs to handle the, the fact that it might need to slow it down and, and wait before it sends a bit more. Below that is the data link layer and that's the one that then says okay the network layer has worked out a route across the network but for each hop across the network the data link layer needs to be able to handle from this hop to that hop so the overall sender to receiver stuff needs to be still on the packets but it needs to handle the individual hops and where am I going on the next hop and from there is what will happen next and so on. So it's, it's, it's an individual hop section. In terms of hardware so at the network layer we're dealing with routers but at, at the data link layer we're dealing with bridges and switches so they're handling the individual hops and it, um, on the slide here it says that this layer deals with error detection and correction it deals, uh, that's where it's primarily dealt with, but we will find that error detection and correction are typically handled throughout the, all the layers, but this one, this layer particularly focuses on that. And then, uh, th then that's split up uh, into two sub-layers because there's a lot that goes on in the data link layer. So it's divided up into the logical link sub-layer and the medium access sub-layer. And then finally we'll define a physical layer which deals with wires, repeaters, hubs and it will be dealing with things like wires and voltages, um, RS-232 um, uh, as a protocol deals with whether you're working on 0 and 5 volts or uh, 15 volts or minus 15, whatever. There are different, the RS-232 is supposed to be one of the most non-standard industry standards around but I know so many the most non-standard industry standards around that it's probably just one of the many that I like that but it will deal with things like pin allocation on the plugs and those sorts of things so it's a very low level uh, scenario now uh, there are other layered models uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the one on the the left hand side of this slide I might even remove it for the uh, for the pictures when I put the video together uh, but particularly there's the OSI 7 layer model that has two more layers in there the presentation layer and the session layer they, they're not layers we're going to be thinking about the OSI layered model is wonderful it's an industry standard that was agreed. Uh, academia went mad on it from about the um, nine, early 1990s onwards and you will still find academia teaching it in various uh, universities uh, because that's what you do. It, it is the agreed model except nobody ever implemented it. There's a wonderful discussion of this in Tannenbaum um, but it highlights a particular issue that um, is uh, uh, com comes up in, uh, again and again. The idea that we have all these standards and you have brilliant standards that are just perfect and nobody ever uses them. Uh, you probably don't remember videotape, VHS. Everyone used VHS. There was a different standard called Betamax. It was a much better standard nobody ever used it in the days when we had so the OSI is, is a, a really interesting museum piece that no one will ever use what we will tend to focus on in terms of practicality is TCPIP because TCPIP in the real world rules the world there is no other option it was in the game first it's well and truly established and it's not likely to be replaced in the near future when we discuss it from an academic point of view we're using the five layer model partly because 
that TCP/IP is a little bit. Um, uh, it, it, it assumes a lot, shall we say? So you'll see below transport and internet. So the internet layer corresponds to the network layer more or less approximately and then below that you have host to network well if you bear in mind that the data link layer is so complicated that it needs to be split into two anyway and you've got the physical layer that's an awful lot in the host to network layer that's why we're splitting that one up we need to move on to think about protocols so first of all let's think about why have we got protocols how do they work so the idea of a protocol is to give us some mechanism for saying how am I going to have a conversation with someone else where we understand things so on the slide here it's someone two people talking and the first one says hi and the other one says yeah hi and the first one says have you got the time and the other one says yeah it's two o'clock end of exchange and it's comparing that with uh, a TCP connection request uh, the server gives back a uh, server response and then you request the file and the file is delivered so that's the idea of a protocol there's an uh, I, th I think a much better example of a protocol which I'll mention because you guys have the sailing coming up and Hopefully, if um, if your skipper is um, willing, uh, he'll introduce you to the radio, the marine radio, while you're on the boats. There is a strict protocol on the radio. Other countries are not always quite as um, disciplined about the protocol as we are in the UK, but there's a good reason for being disciplined on radio protocol, because the clarity isn't always wonderful, so if you have a clear protocol it's much easier to work out what's being said. So the protocol is, uh, you're on a boat, you want to call the Solent Coast Guard, and your routine is Solent Coast Guard, Solent Coast Guard, this is Yacht Pandora, Yacht Pandora, and you finish your bit there, you wait for the reply, Solent Coast Guard will reply, Yacht Pandora, this is Solent Coast Guard, what is your message? And you say, Solent Coast Guard, Solent Coast Guard, this is Yacht Pandora. Um, could you give me a pressure check, please? And Solent Coast Guard might give you a rude reply and say, oh, I've got to cross the room to do that. But they're supposed to say, um, Yacht Pandora, this is Solent Coast Guard, uh, the pressure is da 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 out. That means end of end of message so that's the sort of basic protocol nearly I made a few mistakes on that in rushing it through but you've got the idea uh, and there are other things about the marine radio protocol so you actually have that's where you have things like the alpha bravo if you're spelling and for numbers it's uh, numbers like one two three four five six seven eight nine -er and it's done like that so that you can hear on a bad connection um, so if we come to things like network software we have our protocols we have our layered models we have micro protocols in each level we have connection and connectionless services we thought about that before we have service primitive oh except that with uh, connection services um, there's a few issues in there so connection orientated media needs a connection orientated connection phone conversations or uh, voice over IP need connection orientated orientated services and it implies a quality of service you need to be able to ensure that you can provide a certain bandwidth a certain continuous feed of packets since you're probably going to be um, converting your voice into packets and sending it over the network but there must be a certain standard that you're uh, that you are uh, guaranteeing if you're going to provide a fo voice connection or a media connection, a, a video connection. Uh, you can also have the connection, less connect, um, uh, like uh, things like datagrams, which we've talked about. There will be service primitives, so if you've got a connection orientated service, you need perhaps a listen primitive, you need a, a connect primitive, so you can primitive, you need a, a connect primitive, so you can connect to the server you need a receive primitive a send primitive and a disconnect so there are all sorts of primitives that go on in there so let's have a think about how this all works out in practice first of all let's consider naming and addressing so we've got the issue of the fact that we actually use something like www.bbc.co.uk but at the internet level it's using an address like 212.58.224.83 
So how is that managed? And we need to ask questions like how a unique network layer addresses are signed. So there are 32-bit addresses for the current internet protocol. Uh, that's IP4. Um, we have uh, chunks of data being sent uh, uh, between the various nodes on the network. Um, and we need to know uh, which application packets are meant for. So we've got to ask all these sorts of questions and about how we're handling each hop from the sender to the receiver via the chosen route. So um, applications use, usually use the host names like BBC Co UK. The network layer uses the IP address and that's all mapped by the domain name system, DNS. So a host and therefore applications on the host can query the DNS. The queries are passed to the local resolver and if the local DNS resolver doesn't know the answer, uh, if it doesn't have a local cache of the answer then the query is forwarded up, forwarded up the DNS hierarchy and um, so typically the resolver will ask a, a root server um, with the queries being resolved iteratively or recursively from the response. Um, now in the UK, uh, a, a group called Nominet provide the UK naming service. So you'll see here on this slide uh, that we've got the idea of a DNS hierarchy. So ECS handles any resolutions of ecs.sutton.ac.uk addresses. If it's a Sutton AC UK, not ECS, then that will be handed to the Southampton campus. iSolutions will deal with that and they manage the DNS side for campus-wide stuff. If it's in the academic network but outside of Southampton, so we're looking at I don't know, uh, Leeds or wherever, uh, then it will be handed up again to the Janet area for their DNS to resolve things in the ACUK and if it's outside of the academic area it'll go to Nominet for anything in the UK. Incidentally be a little bit careful about how you consider the address and where it goes to to get resolved. So for example uh, my domain name is argles.org which you would think is an American address because it doesn't carry the UK tag but it's still resolved by Nominet because it's actually residing in the UK. So Nominet handle that. So let's look at our web browser example. Um, so for those of you who are on Comp 2203, the application scripting module, this is now the complementary uh, section to the stuff that we were doing on that module. On that module, we were thinking about what goes on on the client computer and particularly in the web browser software and what goes on on the server computer and particularly what goes on in the server daemon. We're now going to think about the bit that we ignored on that module which is how it actually goes from the web browser onto the network, across the network and then from the network up in, through the layers into until it's presented to the web server daemon. So we're looking at the complementary side of things. So the application uses the target host name. That name, as we've thought, is going to be resolved by a DNS query to target the network layer IP address. And then the transport layer will send the data to the server. But it will do it by passing it down to the network layer, which will attempt to deliver IP packets of data across the destination. And as that goes down through the layers, it will get sent across the first local link hop to the final destination, then do hop, 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 till it gets to the far end. The receiving host needs to know which application or service to pass the received data to. So we have in TCP, we have the idea of port numbers. The server application listens on an agreed port. There are 16 bits for the port number, so it's numbered from 0 to 65535. And 0 to 1023 are privileged ports. And port 80 is the standard port for normal HTTP web traffic. Uh, there are other well-known ports which you can look up on the address on this slide. Um, and one of the things you can see on the graphic here is that if you're using HTTPS as opposed to HTTP then you'll be on port 443 instead of port 80. 
So what happens then is that the web browser makes its request, it goes down through TCP, uh, in practical terms, down through the IP layer, onto the link layer, links over the network to the server, and then that's passed up through the IP layer and up through TCP on the port 80 to the web server. That's how that will work. At each host or router hop on in between, uh, the sender and receiver data is transmitted on the local link technology. So there, there could be different sorts of links as it goes across the network. So within a LAN, it's usually Ethernet, not always, uh, across the LAN, uh, on a, a, a longer hop or even actually within some organisations, you might be using a, um, a protocol called Sonnet on Fibre WAN, for example optic fiber. Uh, at each hop the link layer addressing endpoints change because that depends on the hop that you're taking uh, but the overall addresses for the start and end point will be un un unaltered uh, and address resolution protocol will be used for the IP to Ethernet address mappings. So within a particular hop, uh, Ethernet will broadcast on the sort of open broadcast to everyone to ask who owns a given IP address and the owner should reply indicating which MAC address to use. So for example 192.168.1.12, that's a typical local um, type address, 192.168 is reserved for local networks. Uh, so it's pinging 192.168.1.13. So you can see the little in interchange following that on the slide here. Uh, so it's sending 56 bytes from uh, to 192.168.1.13 and uh, back comes the reply saying it took 57 and a bit milliseconds. Uh, but what's the uh, ad address resolution protocol traffic? So if we did a TCP dump to discover that, we'll find that the first thing that happens is that uh, the, uh, the the local MAC address um, does a um, an ARP to request who has got 192.168.113, tell 192.168.112 what the answer is. Uh, and then the reply comes back uh, that address 113 is, and it gives the MAC address, uh, and then you do the actual re uh, ping, uh, ping request and you get the reply. So there's a little bit of interchanging going on there to work out who you're talking to, who needs to listen to it, uh, how to get it across. That's for a single hop across the network. So quite a lot going on at that level. You can ask what do you actually see as it were on the wire and you can use TCP dump or Wireshark. Um, so Wireshark is, is a fun thing to do. You can see what that will do. It's a, a package, a software package you can download and install. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, there's a few issues about how you install it uh, and how you get it running. You typically need to be super user, root, admin, whatever, depending on which sort of computer you're on as to what you call it, but you will need um, the sufficient privileges to run it on your computer. And you can capture network traffic on any given interface that you have uh, in your control. And a typical Ethernet packet will contain an Ethernet header, an IP header, a TCP or a UDP header, and then the application data, that's the payload. And Wireshark will explain all that information for you. So uh, there's a few slides here which may be difficult to see, but I put them in anyway. Um, uh, it may be that what you really need to do is just install Wireshark and play around with it for yourself just to get a feel for it. But what's going on here is you've got three slides. The first is showing a DNS response in terms of a host contacting a BBC website and asking for a web page, basically. Uh, so you've got the DNS response, the HTTP request, and the Ethernet IP TCP header addresses. So uh, it shows the exchange of data between the hosts. You'll also see in terms of the packet you can actually see the web page going through which is quite fun. Um, 
and you can see the data passing through the underlying layers and uh, yeah you can see the oh, now on this slide where it says that everything should be transparent to the user I always struggle with this concept transparent um, I always sort of think in terms of saying if it's transparent I can see through and see what's going on it doesn't mean that when very often in computing when we're talking about something being transparent it's the, it has a different model I'm thinking in terms of a box with stuff in and if the casing is transparent I can see what's inside nope that's not what it means think in terms of looking through a window at I don't know the house opposite okay if the window is transparent you forget about the window you just focus on the house that's opposite if the window is mucky you see the window so you don't want a mucky window so you see all the muck that's going on in between you want a transparent window that's what it means when it says everything should be transparent to the user in other words the user has no idea what's going on um, underneath the bonnet as it were Okay, here's the slide. So the the first, well, we'll just go through the three slides in terms of the different um, things that are going on when you request this web page. So there's the second, and there's the third, and I'll leave it to you to go back through and have a play, uh, and maybe to install Wireshark, uh, have a go at running it, and see what you can find out by running Wireshark and, and see what's going on.